This is episode 38 of the Magic Detective Podcast. On this episode, I talk about the incredible life of the amazing Ted Anneman. That and more on this episode of the Magic Detective Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Magic Detective Podcast. I'm your host, Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective, and this is episode 38. And today I'm going to dive right into today's feature. So here we go. Uh, Our topic today was born Theodore John Squires on February 22nd, 1907 in Waverly, New York. He became interested in magic around the age of 10 when he saw a friend from school present the classic ball and vase trick, a standard trick found in most magic sets for the past 200 years. Apparently, this was all it took for him to become enthralled with magic, and he began to study all the books he could find on the subject. And his interest in magic overtook his interest in his schoolwork, so his mother took matters into her own hands. She threw all of his books and props into the furnace. Let me read that again. She threw all of his books and props into the furnace. Wow. That's got to do a number on a young kid. In fact, Theo held a grudge for many years, possibly never forgiving his mother for her deed. Years later, he would send his mother a bound edition of the first 50 issues of the Jinx magazine. He inscribed on the first page, Dear Mama, When you look through these pages, I hope you'll remember when you burned my magic books in the furnace. That made me try and write one myself. Have you a match for this? Theo. During his mid-teen years, Theo performed whenever he could. He even enlisted the help of his younger brother Leland to assist him, for which he had to pay Leland because the brother had no interest in magic beyond making a dollar. The trick that they did together was the sub-trunk, or as Houdini often called it, the metamorphosis. Theo Anneman would hold a number of normal jobs in his early days. The first was somewhat unfortunate. He was hired by the Lehigh Valley System Shops in Sayre, Pennsylvania. But a strike was going on when he started, and he became a strike breaker without knowing. He eventually broke into show business as a singer, and he would even become an assistant to a magician. He worked with one guy who had a bird act, and he even worked with Doc Chris's medicine show. All of this is prior to his own career as a mind reader. Now, starting in 1924, when he was a mere 17 years old, he contributed often to the Linking Ring magazine and to the Sphinx magazine. Anneman published some very clever effects, but also published a couple items that really belonged to other performers, even though he put his name on them. And this is where some in the magic world took notice of him. Some took notice kind of a negative notice of him, I guess you'd say. Uh, Two of those being Newman, the mentalist, and also uh, Robert Geisel, the escape artist. Newman was none too happy with Anneman and eventually published a poem, a poem that goes like this. Nor can we forget T. Anneman, that clever, smart, and canny man, whose high-pressure methods cannot be gainsaid. He rehashes mere trifles from old magazine he rifles, then, as new effects, resells them to the trade. A dime store outfit brings five dollars amid the mighty hollers of all the suckers who regard it with regret. Being sadder now and wiser, they feel this lying advertiser is the only living equal to Ovette. Years later, Newman would actually write glowingly about Anneman, but early on, not so much. On April 23, 1927, Ted Anneman married his first wife, Margaret Abrams. She would go by the name Greta. A few years later, on November 1, 1935, they had a daughter, Mona Lee Anneman. In his mid to late teens, Anneman began to correspond with various magicians, among them a man he idolized, Mr. Al Baker. But apparently the idolization didn't go both ways. Baker, much older, wrote some pretty bitter and nasty letters to Anneman, accusing him of theft, among other things. 
And what's most fascinating to me are the responses that Anneman gave. Sometimes he replies in a fairly level-headed way, and other times he, he rips Baker and very often pokes fun at him. It's clear by the way Anneman writes uh, his response letters that Baker was really, really tearing into him at times. The letters span from 1926 to the middle of 1927. They actually appear in the book, The Secret Ways of Al Baker, and are from the Max Maben collection. I would encourage you to take some time and read these letters if you happen to have that book. The most amazing thing is that over time, these two very bitter enemies would grow to respect each other and have a very close friendship. Anneman, in the early days, suffered from the eagerness of youth. Baker, well, he could be a bit crotchety. But I think they realized, and partly due to Anneman's continued insistence, that they both had more in common than not in common. And why not focus on what they both enjoyed? By the 1930s, all of these past squabbles had been cleared up, and the two men became great friends. In the early days of performing as a mind reader, Anneman wore a turban and a cape. It was none other than Al Baker who suggested to Theo to lose the theatrical garb and modernize his appearance, and he did just that. He found he was no less charismatic with modern clothes as he was with his theatrical costume. This was mistakenly recorded in the linking ring as Max Holden being the one who told Anneman to change his costume. Actually, it was Max Holden who did the initial write-up for the February 1947 edition of Pentagram Magazine, but it was indeed Al Baker who told Ted to change his clothes. Anneman did have a gimmick of sorts that he used, which I found kind of interesting, and I don't mean a gimmick in the way that magicians think of it. This is more of a branding gimmick, a way to be remembered. When he would shake hands with the person upon meeting them for the first time, the individual shaking Anneman's hand would discover that his hand was ice cold to the touch, a very unnerving sensation and one that people remembered for a very long time. In 1934, Anneman started his periodical called The Jinx, and by the way, he started going by the name Ted rather than Theo. The very first edition, number one, carries a quote by Al Baker. It says, Al Baker has said that if a person can get one trick out of an issue, it costs them only a quarter. If they find two that they can use, the cost is 12 and a half cents each. However, if they can find use for all three, tis a rare bargain indeed. The Jinx ran from 1934 to 1941. It was the go-to source for the latest in mentalism and card magic. One of my favorite items from the Jinx was something he called the Jinx Five-Foot Shelf of Magic. It was a list of magic books from the time that he felt were very important. And these are the titles listed by importance. Stanion's Magic, The Tarbell Course in Magic, the Stanion Serials, Downs's The Art of Magic, Greater Magic by Hilliard, Sax's Sleight of Hand, Masculine and Devance Our Magic, Professor Hoffman's Modern Magic, Hatton and Plate's Magician's Tricks, Sidney Clark's The Annals of Conjuring, Robert Houdin, The Secrets of Conjuring and Magic, Thurston, 200 Tricks You Can Do, Thurston's 200 More Tricks You Can Do, Erdnays, The Expert at the Card Table, Anneman, 202 Methods of Forcing, Johnson's The Open Book, Lloyd's Thimble Manipulation, Devine's Cigarette Manipulation, Hull's Billiard Ball Manipulation, Lippy's Chemical Magic, Houdini's Paper Magic, Hall's 33 Rope Ties and Chain Escapes, Gibson's Houdini's Escapes, Hearst's The Georgia Wonder, Houdini's Miracle Mongers and Their Methods, DeLorence's Medical Hypnosis and Magnetic Hypnotism, DeLorence's The Book of Black Magic and of Pacts, Prince's The Whole Art of Ventriloquism, Roth's The Roth Memory Course, Carrington, The Physical Phenomenon, Abbott, Behind the Scenes with the Mediums, Alexander, The Life and Mysteries of Dr. Q, Hull's How to Answer Questions for the Crystal Gazing Acts, Duesenbury, 
Making Magic Pay, Glenn, The Road to Fame, Funk and Wagnall's The Practical Standard Dictionary, and finally, The Globe Book Company, Elementary Grammar. And I have to point out an effect listed in the jinx that I love and in the right audience could bring down the house. It's, uh, it's called A Matter of Policy, and it's based on an old elimination game. But the premise is Republicans and Democrats uh, are printed on cards, and you have these cards uh, through a process um, mysteriously eliminated. And it's rather uh, has a rather funny outcome. Now, in today's highly polarized environment, I'd never suggest doing such a trick, but if you're with a group of fellow partisans, you could certainly achieve great acclaim, as the outcome, like I said, is quite funny. If you're unsure as to the political beliefs of those present, do not, under any circumstances, present this trick you have been warned. Trust me, I live in Washington, D.C. You could be putting your life in danger. But... At the same time, I would look it up. It's kind of a kind of a funny trick, a matter of policy, and it could be adapted to lots of different topics besides uh, Republicans and Democrats. So anyway, back to the story. Even though he wrote countless routines on mentalism, the one effect Anneman is best known for was his version of the bullet catching trick. He used a method devised by Orville Meyer, and though I won't tell you how he did it, let's just say... It was extremely dangerous. John Booth, in his book Psychic Paradoxes, shares a story of standing next to Animan while he was preparing to do the bullet catch. In Booth's opinion, at the time, it was a little too over the top. His words were, Ted was making requests with almost a fanatical zeal. I, th- I thought he was ridiculous. You can carry showmanship, but so far... Now, when it came time for the actual stunt, Booth notes that Ted was shaking and pale. When the gun was fired, Ted spun around in a circle and hit the ground face down, motionless. After generally freaking everybody out, he slowly began to move. He stood up and he spit out the bullet onto the plate along with a little bit of blood. After this, John Booth found out the truth as to what was happening, and he totally understand exactly why Animan was so firm about his requests, and frankly why he looked so pale just before the gun was fired. Animan was truly staring death in the face, and the slightest miscalculation would have meant certain death for Ted. There's an interesting story in the new the new Jinx. July 1965, where the story is related about an event between Bill Neff, the famous spook show guy, and Anneman. It seems that Neff had encouraged Ted Anneman to attempt a blindfold drive. This was going to be part of a, to, to publicize an upcoming show. Well, Anneman, after chugging down several alcoholic drinks, puts the blindfold on and proceeds to drive perfectly with no issues for 10 miles. The following day, Anneman was driving home from the gig and wrecked his car, this time totally sober. He went on to exclaim, if I'd been wearing the damn blindfold, this never would have happened. Now, I've got a couple thoughts about Anneman and Houdini. Now, they did not know each other, but here's just a few interesting things about the two of them, because they lived... um, in kind of the same time period, even though Anneman was uh, much younger. In a letter to Al Baker, Anneman writes, I have viewed an unknown man perform the upside-down jacket escape in less time than the wondrous Houdini, and on the terra firma stood a thin throng of laymen from whom a collection was solicited. Then, on a chilly day in the jam streets of Detroit... I viewed the marvelous Houdini drawn to a height on the Fife building and receive a wonderful ovation at his extrication. In another letter, speaking of Houdini, he writes, I am not better than Houdini. I never thought so. But I I never envied his skill or knowledge. I wanted my own head and my own brain. However, I wanted his showmanship. 
In another letter, he mentions that it's near impossible to correspond with Houdini. Perhaps Anneman had sent some letters to Houdini but did not hear back. This is me just speculating. And they are connected through a number of routines. Uh, first, of course, the subtrunk, which I mentioned earlier. They both did the subtrunk. Uh, then there were a number of spirit and slate effects that both men kind of featured in their acts. The East Indian needle trick was uh, one that Houdini turned into a signature routine. It was hardly his creation, but he made it his own. Along came Anneman. And around 1924, devised his own version of the trick, which had a different method than Houdini's. He would eventually publish his version in the first issue of The Jinx. Then there's this story, which I love. Ted was chosen, along with Paul Rossini and John Booth, to perform for the police chiefs of western New York State. Despite bringing in three heavy hitters, the show was actually considered small. Rossini did some of his popular card routines. John Booth presented his version of the needle swallowing. And Ted, however, Ted brought out two pair of handcuffs and requested to have them secured behind his back. He was then escorted into a side room from the banquet hall. The moment the door closed, you could hear a loud racket and all this commotion coming from the room. When the door was open, Anneman was standing there looking a wreck. His hair was all messed up, and he was still handcuffed. But one odd point, his hands were somehow mysteriously handcuffed through the arms of a chair. The audience was confused. Ted apologized profusely and asked for a second chance. He was uncuffed, the chair was removed, and then he was recuffed and put back in the room. And again, a loud noise was heard, rattling, yelling, cussing. The door was open, and again, this time, Ted was still locked with the cuffs, but this time around a water pipe. And this time, the audience... Well, they kind of got in on the joke. They realized that Anneman was presenting a master illusion in record time. It was funny, amazing, and he won over the audience. In 1941, Max Katz, an amateur magician and Wall Street accountant, was to produce a show starring Ted called Anneman the Enigma. It was going to be a two-evening performance that took place on January 26 and 27, 1942, the show would take place in the Channon Building in New York City at the Little Theater in the Sky, which was a rooftop theater, apparently. The Channon Building still stands, but I think the theater's long gone. At any rate, the big feature of this event would be Anneman presenting his bullet-catching miracle live on stage, a feat which has caused the untimely deaths of 12 performers, or so it is written in the advertisements. Anneman had presented the bullet catch four times previously, always outside, never on a stage. This would be a new situation for him. And by the way, for the curious, Max Katz was also a student of Anneman, as well as Vernon and Slidini and others. And he was also the grandfather to Ricky Jay. Now, according to my research, January 1942, Ted Anneman was broke. He had a number of health problems and he had become an alcoholic. It seems he may have even had a pending divorce Walter Gibson said of Anneman, he was an odd man with dark moods. Add to this the existing situation, he was known to have panic attacks, be difficult and hard to understand. He was a complex character, a creative genius, and a flawed human. And all of that came to a head on January the 12th, when Ted Anneman took his own life in a rather gruesome way. Of course, Ted lives on through his books and writings, but the man was only 34 when he passed on. It was tragic. And for some reason, whenever I hear the name Anneman, I always think about the fact he committed suicide first before I get to thinking about his magic. It was such a waste, such a terrible thing. He left behind his second wife, Janet, whom he had married back in 1938, as well as a daughter from his first marriage, Mona Lee, and his mother, who had burned up all his magic books back when he was a boy, she lived to be 93, having passed away in 1981. Theodore Anneman is buried with his grandmother, Josephine Hayes, who passed away in 1931, in the Gledwoods Cemetery in Waverly, New York. Now, if you'd like to learn more about Ted Anneman, I suggest the new book by Todd Carr titled Anneman's Enigma, 
from the miraclefactory.net. I do not have this book. I I don't have it yet, and so I couldn't use it when I was preparing this podcast, and I'm almost glad I didn't because I really had to dig hard to find information on Animan. But this new book promises a great deal more stories of his life, many unheard of until now, and a reproduction of all his printed material and more. It would make an ideal gift this holiday season, so why not treat yourself or treat a friend, even to Animan's Enigma by Todd Carr, available from miraclefactory.net. And I say that, uh, I give that such a high endorsement because I have uh, so many of the Miracle Factory Net uh, books and they're all fantastic. So I know this one's going to be the same. Now, just incidentally, I, I, the reason I chose Ted Anneman's story at this point in time has more to do with his death than his life. We are fast approaching the winter holidays, and no matter what your belief system, there's got to be some holiday out there for you to partake in. And it's usually a time of families and friends gathering together, and it's a time of joy and happiness and so forth. But, but for some people, this time of year can be terribly lonely, a very depressing time even. I know there are those out there that suffer during this time of year. So my wish is that if you know someone who's alone or suffering, reach out to them. Let them know you're thinking of them. Uh, I'm not sure. The SAM used to have in the Mum magazine, they used to print um, a little column like words of good cheer that you could send cards or letters or whatever to people that were, were sick. If they still have that, I, I, use that. Go to there, uh, go to that little section, reach out to those people. I don't know if it's in there anymore, but it used to be. And, uh, and just, you know, and contact some people and just say, hey, uh, you know, I was thinking of you and just be a friend. Trust me, sometimes what you might think is a small gesture may make all the difference in a person's life. We are all in the magic business, right? So try and use some of your magic this holiday season to reach out with the magic of friendship. And that's my wish for everybody this year. Um, by the way, that's this is not the last uh, podcast for the season. I just wanted to get that little message out there. And you can, you know, whatever you think is... Uh, the best way to go about it. I mean, you could um, you could take a friend to lunch that you haven't seen in a long time, or or stop by and visit, or send them a card. I'm mean, you know give them a phone call. I'll leave that up to you. Okay. So, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Magic Detective Podcast. My name is Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective. Until next time, be well and be safe.